Welcome to the Health and Wealth Podcast with your host, Dr. Vincent Buscemi. Every time I leave a podcast, I always think to myself, this was the best one. And I definitely thought this after talking to Dr. Darren Schmidt, chiropractor and CEO at the Nutritional Healing Center of Ann Arbor. Amazing. If you want to know about the root causes of disease, what lactic acid doses is, and how to get healthy again, This is absolutely the podcast you want to listen to. Dr. Darren, if you're listening, I can't thank you enough for an amazing podcast. You're truly going to change a lot of lives. You've helped me out a lot too. All right, guys, you're going to love this episode. I'll see you guys soon. Question is, what's your origin story? What sparked you to take this alternative path to healing people? Well, my origin story is uh, I grew up on a farm and I spent 17 summers working on the family farm. It was started in 1936 or something by my great grandfather. And so it was pretty holistic. You got to be a holistic person to work on a farm and make it work well. And I was pretty much a laborer, not that I made decisions on when to plant and stuff and when to harvest, but I had ideas of helping people. My mom talked about being a doctor. And then when I was in undergraduate, I did a survey of 12 people, 12 students and doctors of medicine, and I asked them about their profession and none of them encouraged me to go into medicine. So I, um, is this audio still good? Yeah, you sound great. Okay, I just did something with the laptop. No, you sound great. So I guess, quick question, why did those 12 people discourage you into going into medicine? Um, they mostly discouraged me because of the admin work, the paperwork and stuff. And they're talking about insurance. You know, this is, you know, 1993 and it's, you know, certainly not any better, but they said, if you're built for it, like the one guy had his son in medical school and he was built for research. And so, uh, based on that, I went to, uh, visit a few other kinds of doctors, a veterinarian, optometrist and podiatrist. And then I thought, you know, visited a chiropractor. And what he was doing was manual labor, which I'm very used to because working on a farm, you know, adjusting backs. And then he said that you can have a problem in your back causing leg pain. So when you treat the pain in the leg, you're lost. I was like, okay, that's pretty holistic. And so that's how I started. But when I was in chiropractic school, initially, I'd never even been adjusted. I'd never been to a chiropractor. And here I am like first semester and I get my first adjustment. And so therefore... I wasn't really married to this idea of adjusting the spine to get people well. I mean, it's a great concept. I love it. I still do it. Um, But I went to a lot of different seminars in school. I went to two a month for two years outside of the school, like uh, seminars and stuff. And there was one in particular by a guy named Dr. Joel Wallach. And he's still around. He's 80 something years old or more. And he's still lecturing. He's got several, uh, nutritional companies and supplements and herbs and stuff like that. Anyways, he was talking about nutrition. And then when I left that seminar, I thought, okay, I want to be a chiropractor who focuses on nutrition. So I graduated school 97, did chiropractic for one year, started nutrition in 98. And then in 2005, I quit taking insurance. And that's a big deal for a doctor to stop taking insurance because now you actually have to get people well. And so you know, there's a lot of doctors that take insurance and never get anybody well, but they still get well paid, which is sad, super sad. So I'm in the free market and patients are paying me directly. Not only that, they already have their own insurance that they're paying monthly. So it's my job to get people well, and I have to have those results to stay in business. Anyway, so putting all that together, that's what brought me to the place where I'm at now. What was the final decision to drop all insurances? Well, the final decision to drop all insurance was this, um, the fact that they never asked me if the patient would get better. So I'd fill out these forms about treatment and treatment times, how many visits, how long is your treatment plan? It's all about treatment. And I'm, I'm waiting for them to ask me when I'm going to get the patient better because that's what it's all about. You know, if patients don't get better, what, what's the point? Yeah. And so I was on insurance and off, on and off, on and off several times. And I finally stopped at November 1st, 2005. And then that month was my best month to date, you know, at that time. Of course, my practice is a lot larger now, but it was a fine decision to do that. And then it also created this demand where I have to do, 
have to run a business better than anybody else. You know, like marketing's got to be there. The accounting's got to be there. The management, you know, HR, all that stuff. It's got to be top notch instead of working at a hospital and just dispensing therapies and then going home. Like it's, it's the whole, I'm pretty holistic in all forms, you know, healthcare, business, finance, all that stuff. And you have a pretty big operation. So I looked at your website. You have seven doctors that work underneath you or seven practitioners. There's nine. nine. Wow. Yeah. All in one location. Well, yeah. I'm number nine. So there's eight others in one, in one building. We're going to expand in that building. We get in a couple of years, we'll get another, um, quarter of the building. So we'll have 7,500 square feet. Wow. That's amazing. And you're doing good work. So what is your foundation for nutrition? What type of thinking do you follow? The foundation for nutrition is diet. And I got several books here. So one of them is called Ravenous. I don't know if you know about this book. It's amazing. And it's got to be historical. You got to, if you don't know your past, then you don't know your future. So this goes back from the early 1900s, Otto Warburg, this is the uh, greatest physiologist of all time. Like he figured out cancer in 1932, but it says Otto Warburg, the Nazis and the search for the cancer diet connection. What I got from this book was in 1913, they knew that cancer feeds, I'm sorry, sugar feeds cancer. And so they were on this idea of like, okay, so Hitler's mom died of breast cancer and the Nazis were so anti-meat because everybody thought that meat causes cancer. And um, not true, right? It's white sugar. And so everybody needs to get off sugar. That's the foundation. And then you got to, and then past that, then you have unlucky exposures. So you have lime, mold, parasites, metals, chemicals, just being on planet earth, or if you, you know, swim in a pool or a lake or something, you might pick something up. Or if you're in a building that's moldy, or you're working with chemicals, or you're eating food wrapped in plastic, do you get, you know, microplastics? If you're wearing a mask, your lungs get filled up with micro microplastics. So you got to get the, the bad stuff out. So you remove the sugar and the seed oils and now you're left with meat and vegetables. And then how much meat do you need versus vegetables like this? So some people prefer more meat and less vegetables, other people the other way around, but you got to get that straightened out and then detox all the bad stuff out of the body. And then after that, nourish the organs. So have supplements that are organ specific. So I just learned that Otto Warburg was Jewish, but because Hitler was so scared of cancer, he was one of the few Jewish people that they did not execute. One of the scientists they kept around. That's true. A lot of the Jewish, I mean, Berlin was the center of science in um, 1928. You know, and then the, the Jews, the scientists that were Jewish were started to get, you know, executed or they left and moved to England or America. But Otto Warburg was such a jerk. He was just such a jerk. People hated him. He argued with everybody. And the Nazis, the SS troops came to his lab several times. And he shooed him away. And he would claim that they stunk, which is, you know, their hygiene was bad. Like that was the greatest insult at that time. And um, he did end up moving out of Berlin, just a little bit north. So he didn't leave Germany. <clears throat> it's so fascinating. So um, Operation Barbarossa is the name of the 4 million, Rus uh, 4 million German soldiers invading Russia. That was the name of it. But a few months before Operation Barbarossa, it was called Operation Otto. Maybe named after Otto Warburg. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So I think, you know, according to this book, Hitler secretly loved Otto Warburg. I'm sure he did. So do you follow, I, I, I listened to a previous podcast where in 2018, you went carnivore. Are you yeah. currently still zero carb? No, I, I'm 95% meat. Okay. So I have some carbs. Yeah. And in 2018 to 2019, I had um, my, one rule and that was eat as much meat as I possibly can every day. And then, and I put on weight. I was in ketosis every day, I gained 10 pounds, went to the gym a lot, put on a lot of muscle. <clears throat> and then my clothes were too big, too small. So I was like, okay, well, I probably need to get a new wardrobe or I could lose some weight. So I changed my rule to eat as much meat as I need or want for the day. 
So I just started eating less meat per day. So it's been like, you know, since 2019, I've been doing that. It's been fantastic. Yeah. Have you been in ketosis since then? Or do some of the carbohydrates you eat kick you out of ketosis? Yeah, some of the carbs will kick me out. So I cycle in and out of ketosis. Okay. Because yeah. I always worried about metabolic flexibility. And sometimes when I'm in ketosis too long, my cortisol feels, I mean, I don't measure it, but it seems too high. And I have trouble like sleeping sometimes. Yeah, that's legit. So how often yeah, do you... So you yeah, so then you eat some fruit, raise up your insulin, drop your glucagon, you know, and then change those hormones around. How often are you getting out of ketosis or is it just how you feel? I think I'm in and out like once a week. Okay. So during the weekdays when I see patients, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, it's it's meat. And then on the weekends I eat more carbs, then I'm, I'm out. And I haven't really measured much. I mean, the last time I measured for ketones was probably three months ago. In the last year, I've probably measured like four times because I've you know, been doing this for so long. But I know like, and if I want to, I'll just do a 24 hour fast. And certainly I'll be in ketosis within eight hours or 10 hours or something like that. Other than the anti-cancerous effects of ketosis, what are some of the benefits you feel by being in ketosis? Well, it's more about what do I feel when I come out of ketosis. My brain doesn't work so well. And my muscles aren't as strong and I'm not as fast. Um, that that's, you know, and, but there is some value though, to raising up your insulin, you know, if you're in ketosis for a long period of time, depending on how everybody, you know, everybody's different. So it depends on how you feel, but when I'm in ketosis, then I feel more calm, a bit stronger. My brain is solid. Emotions are, my emotions are stable anyways, but you know, stability occurs with ketosis. Have you read the book Brain Energy by Chris Palmer? No, but I follow Chris on social media. He's fantastic. Okay. He talked about in 2016, I don't want to use the word cured, but he had a patient that resolved all schizophrenic symptoms with a ketosis diet. And when I'm on the ketosis diet, it almost has an anti-anxiety, anti-depressive mood. Yeah, for sure. So Georgia Ede, do you know her? Yep, she's a carnivore doctor. She's a psychiatrist at Harvard. Yep. So she just published, I think it was 2019, a uh, 31 inpatient clinical trial ketogenic diet for um, schizophrenia, bipolar, and major depression. So 28 of the 31 patients had one of those three diagnoses, and then the other three had something else. But um, anyways, 100% of the patients felt better. 43% had a complete remission of their disease, their disease condition. So yeah, the ketogenic diet for brain health, mental health. And this is why I think, you know, everybody's seems like everybody's so loony. You know, if you're watching the TV news and you're on social media and you're getting grabbed by bad news and you're like, why do people act that way? It's because they're not eating liver and red meat. They're eating what the government's telling them to eat. And then they lose their emotions and they're, go off the rockers and they start wanting to, you know, do bad things to other people. It's nuts. Oh yeah. Whereas hundred years ago, like it, I mean, it's a different story hundred years ago, but whatever. Well, my generation is so fragile. There is research out of Brazil that shows when kids eat junk food, their mental stability just plummets. And you have all these kids with ADHD, OCD, um, ODD, oppositional, I'm not sure the whole thing, but oppositional defiance. Disorder. Yeah. So kids go nuts when they eat junk food. So I totally agree with you. Food's got to be a huge, huge contributing factor. Yeah. So in the meantime, when people don't understand that they blame guns, they blame video games, they blame music, they blame the parents or the teachers or the whoever. It's like, no, no, it's the food. And then when people feel bad, they go on psychiatric drugs and it says on the label, Right on the box, it says increases suicidal and homicidal thoughts or ideation. Yeah. And so you had junk food with psych drugs. Oh, my gosh. No wonder. It's a perfect storm. So when I was researching lactic acidosis, one of the treatments was ketosis um, to improve mitochondrial function. But can you give me a foundation of what lactic acidosis is? Lactic acidosis is the most common mechanism of chronic disease. And that's what Otto Warburg and his contemporaries were figuring out back in the 1930s. And then that definition changed over the decades. And the definition now is so different and so clinically irrelevant now 
compared to 85, 90 years ago, is so much more um, useful to know that. So lactic acidosis is not using mitochondria to make ATP, which is very efficient. And you get a lot of ATP from it, you get 32. And then instead of doing mitochondrial function, you're fermenting lactate. Lactate comes from excess sugar metabolism. So when people are eating a lot of sugar, they make lactate. That lactate builds up and then it is then it's fermented like when yeast makes bread or beer that's fermentation and that fermentation process does not need oxygen whereas mitochondria need oxygen to make the atp very well um, when there's no oxygen then your body goes into fermentation and so that's okay when you're an athlete and you're running you're sprinting and your muscles run out of oxygen because you're out of breath, you're breathing heavier, your blood pressure goes up and it's, you run out of oxygen, but now your muscles switch over to burning or fermenting lactate, which is totally fine. And then you recover within five minutes when you're done. But if you're chronically ill and your mitochondria don't have oxygen and your blood is low in oxygen, then all, then your cells end up fermenting lactate every day, all week, all month, all year, that's the mechanism of chronic disease. So I experienced this in uh, the the late, well, mid mid winter, let's say January, February of 2016, I had black mold. I didn't know it, but I'm sitting on the couch. It's 10 o'clock at night on a Monday night. I'm just sitting there and I'm out of breath. It's just and my body's cold <sighs> like that. And I'm like, what is happening? And my heart starts pounding. My blood pressure is up. It's as if I just start, you know, just stopped running and my body can't keep up, but I'm just sitting there. So I started going through my old books. I have a whole bunch of like old historical nutrition and medical textbooks. I got, I, I got one book coming up here. I started going through this book again. I'd read this before and there's an article in here written in 1958 talking about the mechanism of lactic acidosis and the symptoms that you get from it. What book is that? It's called From Soil to Supplement. You can get this at ifnh.org, International Foundation for Nutrition and Health. And so this is Dr. Roy Lee. He's the guy that created Standard Process, the supplement company. So it says a course in food, diet, nutrition taught by Dr. Roy Lee. So he would write a, a newsletter twice a month for like 30 years. And um, <clears throat> these are a collection of his best articles. But he, one of the symptoms of lactic acidosis is that the vein, the arteries, they dilate and they get engorged, the capillary engorgement. And so I remember looking at my wrist, like, why are my, why is it so big and blue? Like, what? And I, when I read that in that that book, I was like, oh, it's it's this mechanism he's talking about. And when I read that paragraph, I was so it answered all these questions. As a matter of fact. It answers every question about healthcare in any way. Why do drugs make people sicker? Why does heroin make people addicted? Why do people smoke cigarettes? You know, with anxiety, cigarettes will relieve the anxiety. Why can somebody have fibromyalgia and then calf cramping and depression? And it's all the same mechanism. Like it, like it just answered all these questions that I had developed over years. And when I read that paragraph, I set the book down. I was so happy. I had to run around the house a few times <laughs> like a dog with zoomies. <laughs> and then I picked the book up again, read it again, set it down, ran around the house. I did that like three times. And so I called up some people who were former lecturers for Standard Process. I said, did you know about lactic acidosis the way that it's described in 1932? And they said, no. So I think that information was lost in uh by 1961 is the year that i picked for when that information was lost for i picked that year for a couple of reasons but nobody's really talked about it until i brought it back up in 2016 2017 when i started talking about it in my youtube channel uh very quickly i had a two-month waiting list because people realized oh this is you know this is me so but the one thing about it it's not a cause it's a mechanism and i even knew that back then i was accused by some people like oh you're it's, it's not, you know, they said that I said it was a cause. It's like, no, it's a mechanism. So what's the cause? What causes oxygen to go down in the blood and these waste products to go up in the blood? That's, that's part of it, right? Oxygen goes down, 
waste goes up, the blood gets um, hypoxic and toxic, and then the blood's trying to get more nutrition and oxygen to the cells. The blood's also trying to retrieve toxins from the cells, but none of that exchange happens because the blood is so poor quality. Then the cells start to starve and die. Then you get cell death, tissue death, organ death, body death. That's how most people die. And their diagnosis is cancer or heart disease usually, but the mechanism is led to gastrocytosis. So, but the, but what happens when muscle cells die? They tighten up and the term is commonly known as rigor mortis. So if you have a dead body on the floor, within a few hours, it'll be really tight from, and then after 12 or more hours, it'll get loose again because the muscle proteins are broken down. So that's the mechanism. So people, the first symptom commonly that people get with lactic acidosis is muscle cramping, muscle dysfunction, and then tightening of the chest, the diaphragm, and the intercostal muscles, they, they, people can't breathe. And then the heart starts pounding. And then they run to the ER, or they call an ambulance, they think they're having a heart attack, they go to the ER, and they say, oh, your heart's fine, you just have anxiety, go see a psychiatrist, and you get put on Xanax. And that's totally not it at all. It's, 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 there's a cause for it. The cause could be parasites, mold, bacteria, and those toxins that those organisms make. It could be chemicals, it could be metals, toxicity, and it could be too much sugar as this, as these guys figured that out or refined carbohydrates consumed over the course of, you know, decades. So it's this collection of causes that creates this mechanism of lactic acidosis. And then you get a bunch of symptoms. So, so I'm understanding this correctly. The foundation is lack of oxygen in cells. Is that kind of the basic premise of lactic acidosis? And that leads to all the symptoms? Yeah, lack of oxygen and then too much toxicity too much in the blood. Okay. Yeah. And then the mitochondria, they don't work very well. And then your body's using sugar instead of the mitochondrial. It's using glycogen instead of mitochondria, which when you're using mitochondria, it's called oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, so sugar is a poor way to make ATP. Oxidative phosphorylation is an excellent way to make ATP. And that's why ketosis is so important in fasting because then you start using mitochondria. But when you're using a lot of sugar and you're never in ketosis and you're 65 years old or 80 years old, and then you have a heart attack and you're like, but I had, I ate a vegetarian diet my whole life. I had a clean diet my whole life. I ate Ezekiel bread. It's like, you never got into ketosis. You never, you know, you never got it. You, the, ke you know, the ketogenic diet breaks down pathological tissue like fibroids, cysts, tumors, skin tags, moles, you know, fat, fat cells get smaller in the ketogenic diet. But when you're burning sugar all this time, you're building up tissue, it's anabolic. So you build up fibroids and cysts and cancer tumors and skin tags and, and bone, bone spurs, you know, that kind of stuff. So ketosis reverses all these disease processes that sugar, that sugar makes. But getting back to just as a reminder that when you're doing glycolysis a lot, you're making a lot of lactate and then you get lactate fermentation. And with lactate fermentation, you end up making negative amounts of ATP. It's pretty wild. It, it could be, it, it can drain your life and that's called cachexia. So when people have a heart attack or cancer and they keep eating, let's say they're eating 2000 calories a day and they keep losing weight, that's called cachexia. That's where this lactate fermentation is so excessive and you can't reverse it and you got six more months to live and you waste away, even though you're eating 2000 calories a day. So this is the whole, this is the whole process of how people die from chronic disease from the very beginning, eating sugar to stopping oxidative phosphorylation, excess glycolysis, excess lactate fermentation, and then, um, cachexia. That's, that's it. So if you, if you understand this, then you can re reverse engineer it and get back to the way that you used to be. And the primary foods for that are red meat and liver. Those are the two foods that fix the four aspects of lactic acidosis. You cool? You with me on yeah, that? Yeah. So I'm thinking about reverse engineering this and I know no time is too early, even if you're in your twenties and you have signs of chronic health start now, but if I come to you as a patient, and I should think I have lactic acidosis, where do you start with me? 
Well, I start by asking, what are your symptoms? Okay. Because I, I need to know what the symptoms are. And then I say, what, you know, what may have caused this? And people say, oh, my diet was horrible until last week. You know, I had a guy, new patient just the other day. He had colon cancer six years ago and now he's got prostate cancer. And um, he's complaining about his medical doctors. And they said, has anybody ever told you not to eat sugar? Any doctor ever told, and he said, no. I said, that's why your doctors suck. Because doctors never told you to stop eating sugar. But um, I'm sorry, I just went off on this tangent about him. What was your No, that, that's totally, that actually answers the question. It's like, so when someone, so let's say you go okay. through my symptoms, I have leg cramping, I have fatigue, I think I have anxiety, but it's actually tightening of the chest, and you diagnose me with lactic acidosis. What step? Right. What? So here's, yeah. So then you got to get to the, the causes that I listed out. Okay. So get more on the carnivore diet. That's a basic rule for most everybody. And then get rid of these other problems, parasites, mold, toxins, and um, enhance mitochondrial function. And there's supplements for all that. Okay. So the diet can potentially reverse the uh, lactic acidosis scenario. And it's the supplements that detox the mold, kill the parasites, detox the metals, chemicals. Yeah. How would somebody know if they have mold? Do they have to do a search in their house or their workplace? Yeah, you got to be a detective in your house and look around and sniff and look for black or gray or green. Look underneath the sinks. You got, And then I did a whole course on this. If, if you have vegetation touching your house, you got to cut that away. Look for water leaks. Look for water stains. That, you know, mold in the house comes from water. So if you have a bad, a bad roof, you have a water stain on your ceiling, that kind of stuff. And then you can test, you can go to a big box that, you know, like Lowe's or Home Depot and get like a mold test, like a Petri dish. And then you have it exposed for 24 hours, close it, send it to the lab or an air capture test and send that to the lab or you can hire a professional. It so... Yeah. Is the reason why you can do an air capture test because the mold releases spores into the air and that will ca catch that? Exactly. And then the um, the mold will start growing on the Petri dish. Okay. In some circumstances, if it's unavoidable to remove all the mold from your house, do, do you move or is there like another defense you can do? Move. You move. Okay. So I've had people move. I've had people quit their jobs. I'm talking patients. It's, it's, it'll kill you. I mean, I actually had a heart attack according to an EKG in August of 2016. So I was in Florida for a vacation and I just felt so bad. So I, I got an EKG. This, and it was my fourth EKG of that year. And, um, it showed possible MI right on the readout. The computer printed that out, you know? So my troponin level, which was normal, so officially it wasn't a heart attack, but it felt like it, you know, the heart's like, it felt like a hamster in my chest wearing spikes, breakdancing, <laughs> just this searing pain and uh, it's horrible. So yeah, mo so I, and I have a patient, he's a financial advisor in Miami and he's been with me on and off for a number of years and he moved into three different condos. The first one, then the second one, third one, they're all moldy. Miami is like a basement. You know, lots of places around the country are wet, like a basement. You got to be really careful with your ventilation system too. And so he moved more to a desert area in the Southwest of the United States. And this is very interesting. So he moved in January and he's, he has all these symptoms. His heart sucks. Everything is so bad. So he calls me up. March, April, April. And he's like, I'm doing all the things. I'm doing sauna, ice plunge, you know, ice water plunge, IV glutathione, um, acupuncture, massage. He's, you know, trampoline. He's doing all these things. And he goes, it's been four months since I moved out of Miami. And I still have all the symptoms at 100%. Nothing's reduced. And I said to him, yeah, I know. Because None of those get to the cause. And I know like there's a lot of podcasters and like Joe Rogan guests, they talk abundantly about these things that just don't work. <laughs> they, I mean, there's research on saunas and ice plunges and extend your life and all this stuff. But 
that's for healthy people. And if you need to get mold out of your body or if you need to get parasites out of your body, I'm talking four foot tapeworms or little tiny strongyloides, you got to take supplements and they got to be the right supplements. And there's not many on the market. Nine, I'm going to say 99.9% .9 of the supplements for mold and parasites don't work. Most of them don't work. And when they do work, I have a lot of patients that are pooping out parasites for two years. You know, back in 07, when I really figured out parasites pretty well, I would get one person to get rid of a parasite this long. And like, we were ecstatic and we thought we were done. No, no. Now I know, I know now that back then that person probably had six more months of parasites that need to come out or maybe a year, maybe two years. So it's, it's the quality of the products. It has to be superior to actually make this stuff work. Where are people getting these parasites? Life. Like, okay. Drinking water, eating food, touching animals, walking barefoot on sand or soil and swimming. But a parasite that's that long, did it grow in the intestines or did you ingest it that long and not know? No, no, you grew it. You grew it. You, you ate some eggs or the, or the little, when the, cause the parasite can be really small and you step on the soil and it digs underneath your toenails where it pierces through your skin and then it crawls up your leg. And sometimes I've seen it where there's a red line going up the leg. You know, within 24 hours of swimming in the ocean or something, I've had patients uh, show me. So different um, parasites have different life cycles. You can go on YouTube and search the name of a parasite life cycle. And you'll see the CDC has the whole life cycle, you know, on the video. And like strongyloides, for example, they're about three millimeters and they're real small. They'll crawl up your foot, up into your um, lungs, and then you cough. Now they're in your mouth and you swallow it. Now it's in your stomach. Then it goes into your intestines and it starts to reproduce. And then you poop it out back onto the soil. That's the idea. So that's, that's, and then there's other carriers too, snails or dogs or cats, you know, Toxoplasma gondii, that's in, that's from cats. And that's why pregnant women shouldn't be changing kitty litter. But what if you're not pregnant? What if you're a man? You still get Toxoplasma gondii, you know, like the stats on that, like the, prevalence is so high like it makes it makes women cheat on their husbands like these parasites affect your the way you think you know like it's it's nuts and this is and it's so ignored in medicine it like medical doctors need to talk about real stuff you know instead they're talking about statin drugs like give me a break what a bunch of quacks yeah. <laughs> real stuff is parasites mold <laughs> bacteria and excess sugar metabolism in the body. Yeah. And you get, if you get an infection, like a bacterial infection or UTI and need a antibiotic, go for it. Okay. But then it comes back, right? Then what? Take it again, take it a fourth time, take it a fifth time. You have to repair the tissue and you got to find out like what other organism or toxin is in the body. There's probably some other pairs. There's going to be some parasite. There's going to be some, a collection. There's going to be a whole collection of organisms. It's not ever just one um, organism, right? It's usually a collection. It's called bio burden. So you have a lot of different life forms that are burdening the body. Yeah. So it sounds like from the bio burden that one thing that's totally in our control is sugar reduction, eliminating oh, yeah. sugar. If you have can get through the initial hard period of it, you can do it. I'm in ketosis, you're in ketosis. But with parasites, We've had to evolve to millions of years of these parasites. Do we have somewhat of a self-defense against them? <clears throat> um, that's a very good question. And parasites over the last few million years or more or whatever, they, uh, a, I would say that you, you have to rely on the, on the uh, medicines, the plants, the herbs to get the parasites out. Okay. That's um, now they're, you know, you could argue that some of them are symbiotic or whatever, but no, they're detrimental. Now, the one thing supposedly that they do that's good for us is they collect garbage and they'll take on heavy metals and chemicals, mold, yeast inside, inside the parasite toxins. And so now you got garbage trucks in your body. And so 
it's difficult. It's, it's unwise to detox metals and chemicals until after you get the parasites out. Cause if you got these parasites, what's the point of trying to detox? So they're not our, they're really in the, in the long run, they're not our friends. No. It sounds like with this bio burden that fasting and autophagy and mitophagy of mitochondria is essential in health. Do you prescribe fasting? fasting to your autophagy, yeah. What, I think what's more important though is just eating meat because meat makes your tissues strong. Okay. What's your immune system? Your immune system, system is skin, mucosal membranes, white blood cells, you know, the cell membranes of you know, that are fatty. All that stuff has to be top notch strong. So I was at a seminar called the Carnivore Conference in 2019, and um, it was run by Amber O'Hearn, O'Hearn, and she was actually like stage two bipolar or something, and she cured that with um, the carnivore diet. She's on stage at this carnivore conference, and she said the reason why fasting works is because it mimics the carnivore diet. Oh, I've never heard it and that way. <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. And the reason why ketogenic diet works is because it mimics the carnivore diet. So when she said that, like I thought of nothing but that for like weeks, you know, it's brilliant observation. So the native diet is meat based, you know, the, the fruits and vegetables that you see at the stores now, they didn't exist a hundred years ago. Those are all man-made and, um, and it's, you know, it's a sign of abundance and it's a sign of technology that we can have these foods. But 200 years ago, people just ate meat. There's a, a article put out on a, I forgot what the source is, but it's a collection of menus from like, let's say 1850 to 1920. And this woman, that was her hobby. She collected menus from restaurants. And so somebody was able to look at them and write this article and give some examples. It's fantastic. And it was just meat. You just go to the restaurant and you're just eating meat. Like there was, there's no, like, I don't know. There wasn't any salad. There was soup with meat in it, but you didn't get like, I don't know, squash. There was no squash, you know, that kind of stuff. It's just different kinds of meat. I'm not, I'm, I'm going to think about that for weeks now. I've always read that the reason why the ketogenic diet cures epilepsy or cures, not cures, I don't want to say cures my podcast, but because it mimics fasting. I never heard it put the other way that fasting and keto works because it mimics the carnivore diet. That's so interesting. Right. Yeah. And if you think about it, it, it makes sense. And so when I get, you know, some people get caught up in fasting and it's fine. But then feeding is the other half of that equation. So what do you eat when you're eating, you know, when you're refeeding the body? And so people say, well, maybe a fruit smoothie. No, no, no. That's just sugar. You know, you can't say that a fruit smoothie is filled with nutrients. You know, you could say it's filled with anti-nutrients, <laughs> whatever. The point is you starved your body of protein and fat during that fast. Now you got to, you know, bring it back in. Now, when you want to eat, when you want to come out of ketosis and raise your insulin up, you know, and flip off the glucagon and do all that, fruit would be the best choice. And so there's a guy that I follow on Instagram. His name is Don Mattis. I've known him since the late 90s. But he started posting some articles about um, anthropology and the study of native tribes and what they would eat. We're talking around the equator. So you would assume that they just be eating a vegan diet because they had fruit available to them 24 hours a day all year. And what was found was that their diet is still meat based. They're eating monkeys and stuff like that. And then they would have some fruit sometimes. So regardless of who your ancestors are, what part of the world your, your genetics are from, it's still a meat based diet. And I'm totally in line with it. I'm going to catch some heat for saying this, but I think the Mediterranean diet, which limits meat is kind of bullshit. I think the only reason why the Mediterranean diet works is because you have c close social connections and it's more of a societal influence on health than actual the lack of meat. Right. And around the Mediterranean, there, there was a variety of um, cultures, you know, and other, some cultures had more meat, some had less. But the reason why the Mediterranean diet was, that term was coined was because, do you know why it was, why that term was? Coined? No. Um, so who's the guy that started the whole, um, oh boy, I forgot his name. He 
he was he created that seven country study ansel keys yep him he loved a vacation in the mediterranean area southern europe was that was he that's for his vacation spot that's why he called it the mediterranean diet yeah i mean he he's been vilified but i just found out that he lived to 101 which is kind of crazy <laughs> and i and i heard that so nina teichel she wrote the book called big fat surprise and that book is fit have you read that book i have not but i know who the author is i haven't read that book though yeah so she's fantastic with her um references like who said what and when and so even ansel keys was was upset by the tyranny of the low-fat community that he started he started the tyranny he was a jerk and it was his word you know my way or the highway kind of thing and so he would squash people's discussions on maybe some fat is good for us for decades and then along comes the 1970s and he's like trying to publish some research he's got some new ideas nobody wants to hear it he's the guy that started that tyrannical you know don't want to hear it kind of attitude amongst the nutrition researchers so i don't know that guy it's too bad yeah he shouldn't have. there's just some people that i don't know <laughs> they, they cause more harm than good let's just yeah well sometimes you you create your own monster and then you kind of want to pedal back because you're open-minded but the community you create is already against you do you follow right. uh paul saladino online yeah. So yeah. he's eating fruit and the hardcore carnivore community is like ousted him because now that he is carbohydrates during the day. So his story is that in medical school, he had psoriasis. Okay. So he goes, he was vegan. Then he went carnivore and the psoriasis went away. And after a year and a half of that, his testosterone was too low. Sex hormone binding globulin was too high. Sleep was bad. And the psoriasis came back. So then he added the fruit. And then the psoriasis went away again. So what does that tell me? He's chasing a parasite. Psoriasis, eczema, totally parasites. It doesn't matter what your diet is. I mean, you got to not feed the parasite. Quit eating sugar. Dairy's bad because that mucousy aspect of dairy is what parasites use to make biofilm, which is their home. But last week, I had a new patient, 22 years old, really bad eczema, and it cycles through, like it looks clear. And then it turns red, white, flakes off, and really itchy. And then it's clear again. This has been going on for a long time. I asked her, when did this start? She goes, oh, it's been really bad for a year. I said, but when did it start? And she goes, oh, I don't know, maybe when I was a teenager. And her mom was in the room. And the mom goes, no, this started when you had eczema when you were seven. I said, okay, so what happened when you were six? Like, that's the main question. Like, what happened just before you got sick? She goes, I don't know. I said, did you travel somewhere? Did you get a new dog? Did you swim in a pool? Did you? And her mom jumped up and was like, we went to Lebanon. She got food poisoning. It was so bad. We're flying back to the United States, we had to stop in London. The whole plane had to land in London to get her off the plane because she was puking and diarrhea. And I said, that's your parasite. You picked up a parasite, you know, in the Middle East where they're, where they're from. And your skin has been bad ever since. Has any doctor ever asked you what happened just before your skin got bad? And she said, no, because they don't care, right? They're just going to give her steroids and that doesn't work. So anyways, uh, she started as a new patient. Um, and, uh, we're, you know, I have full faith that we'll, she'll get parasites out. She'll see them. She'll see worms come out of her and her skin will get better because I've seen it over and over again. Is it always through the stool or does it ever come out orally, the parasite? It comes out orally, through the nose, mm -hmm. every orifice. I've had ears, eyes. Holy shit. It comes out of your ears? All of you know, vagina, pe uh, penis, urine, bladder, skin. I've had parasites crawl out of people's skin, flaking out of their hair. Pull. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I almost don't want to ask this next question because I don't want people to try to treat themselves, but what are some of the supplements that you would give for parasites? The supplements I use are from a company called Cellcor Biosciences. Now, in my, and they just started six years ago. It's a new company and they grew really quickly because their products are so awesome. Now, 
remembering that I started doing nutrition in 98 and I started using wormwood and clove and oregano and diatomaceous earth. And I'm trying all these things with really poor results. And there, you know, you know, a lot of people have their parasite product and they say they have great results, but I'm telling you, I went through, we're talking 20 years of me trying to get parasites out of people. And I had some success, but then when Cellcor came out and I had a patient with a really, really horrible colitis, his colitis was so bad that he would vomit and it was like contents from his stomach, right? Which is, you know, what you would expect. And then again, it was green, which is bile. And then it was brown. He was actually vomiting poop. That's how bad his colitis was. I put him on a product called Para2 from Cellcor. He got out four or five tapeworms and they were four feet long. And they're all like intertwined like that. And then he was good. He was good for like a year. He ended up getting surgery, fine. But at least he got his parasites out and he needed to get that, you know, that part of his damaged colon repaired. So cell core biosciences and they only sell through practitioners because they're, these products work so good. You got it. You have to be directed, you know, like, and even, you know, and even somebody who's well-versed in how they work, you, you really got to know, like, you, and you got to take people through a step-by-step -step process. So you can't just start with parasites. You got to get the body ready. If they're constipated, make the bowels work. If the liver gallbladder is not working well, get those working. And before that, make sure their diet's good. And then you can start with the parasites in the intestines. And then you start with the, then you go to the parasites that are from head to toe. And that's where you get the people blowing their nose and parasites come out. I've had three parasites come out of my nose. Then after that, then you detox metals and chemicals. And after that, then you tackle Lyme. Lyme meaning organisms that are sitting inside the cells causing damage there. And then after that, um, maintenance, optimization, feeding the organs, because you can clean the whole body out and you can stop lactic acidosis, but yet the organs are dysfunctional. So then you got to get the, you got to get the right supplements to feed the organs. Each organ, you know, de requires different nutrition. So this, what, so what I'm saying right now, we're talking about supplements, right? So when I watch people on social media and they say, you should do an ice plunge, and take a multivitamin and you should eat the carnivore diet like that's ugh, so scratching the surface and i know of holistic doctors that are anti-supplement but they know nothing about supplements they think that a good vitamin is a flintstone or a centrum or something like that or you go to costco and you get a big tub of fish oil like there's no way like that's not that's not good for you at all so you got to get really precise and it's like surgery with supplements, you know, you're, you're targeting a condition, an organism, an organ, you know, you're cleaning up the blood, you're increasing oxygen, you know, you're, in, you're increasing circulation, getting the liver to work right, getting, you know, all that stuff. So there's a lot to it. There's the, the whole social media um, environment regarding healthcare needs to um, do a little bit more studying. And I think we are um, because in the evolution of, YouTube, for example, I've been on YouTube since 2013 and I, um, I see people are smarter now than 10 years ago. And the comments that I get are smarter and there's less number of jerks, you know, and there's less number of people who are just so adamant, kind of like an Ansel Keys kind of person, you know? So it's, it's evolving. It's, we're getting better. It's, I, and I'm, I'm very hopeful. I think it's, I think it's great. And especially since 2020 with the pandemic, People have opened their eyes to the travesty that is um, the shots and the total, what's the word for Dr. Fauci, you know, and Dr. Burks, like Dr. Burks said, oh, we knew the vaccines wouldn't work, you know, that kind of stuff. So people are now see that more than ever before. I think people are starting to maybe disregard what authority says because how many times during the pandemic did they back up what they said and said, we meant this, we really meant this. And before you know it, you have to have a mask on and you're not helping anyone. Right. And then I saw a thing where Dr. Walensky published some book or published something. And she was saying, we just made stuff up like the six foot distance, social distancing. They just made that up. And then the limit of 10 people at a gathering, 
they knew it well at least that'll stop concerts you know like they just made up this number it's all fake it's fake just like the food pyramid everything <laughs> everything's fake yeah well we both live in michigan i remember when they said you could go to home depot you can't buy like flowers but you can buy paint like if you buy flowers the world will collapse but it's okay to buy paint that's definitely made yeah, you, up you couldn't buy seeds i took a picture i was at uh, meyer at my meyer locally here it's like, and they had this yellow caution tape um, around like the lawn chairs, you know, like outdoors and the seeds and the shovels and stuff like that. You can't shop there, but you could shop on the, you know, just right next to it and on the other side of it. Yeah. It's like, yeah, that's, buying the seeds makes the virus more contractible, I guess. <laughs> that's our governor, Gretchen Whitmer. Yeah. So we're coming up on the hour mark and I always ask my guests at the end, what is one takeaway you'd want the audience to have from this discussion? One takeaway from this discussion. Well, <clears throat> one takeaway is that if you have some chronic illness like fatigue and depression and whatever, um, there, most people don't know how to tackle that. And and there's a lot of um, good intentions. And sometimes even I have a hard time with that, although my results are pretty good. But you got to keep searching and don't give up. And so the quality of the supplements and the technology and the food advice it's and, and the body care products, all this stuff is getting better and better over the last, you know, I've been at this now for 30 years. I started studying nutrition in 30 years. So um, the consumer demand is very important, right? So we have practitioners and they have a supply and the demand for the, from the consumer needs to be higher and higher and higher, right? So then the supply from the practitioners needs to meet that demand. So if you just, if you have, you know, some concerns about your health and you go to a medical doctor and they take your blood and they say, oh, your cholesterol is 205, go on a statin drug. Like that is the stupidest thing ever and the answer is go on the ketogenic diet or carnivore diet, watch your lipids, they'll all get normal after a while. But, you know, keep searching on for more information on social media, social media, internet, that's like absolutely the best, you know, way to, to keep up to date with the latest and greatest. But don't forget the books, you know, like I just, I pulled up all these other books, like when I had mold, you know, I, I grabbed, I got that one. Wait, wait what, what's that book? The most common, the most deadly by Jane Lynn. Okay. About mold, right? Because it's the most common, the most deadly thing. And then, of course, this is a classic. There's so much information right, with these books. Nutrition and Physical Degeneration by Weston Price. I got that book right here. There you go. <laughs> and then this here's lactic acidosis, um, clinical and biochemical aspects of lactic acidosis. Okay. And this is 1976. I paid 400 bucks for it. And the forward is by Sir Hans Krebs. Oh, wow. Okay. The cycle guy. Yeah. So that's the history of medicine, right? In these books is honestly just as important as new information and new technology, because guess what? They had the carnivore diet in, in this book, you know, this is all this is about the carnivore diet. Yeah. Although that word is never in there. And the, the word keto or ketogenic is not in there, but that's what this is about. It's about the kind of diet that, is very popular right now. I don't know. Did I answer your question? Okay. Yeah, that was perfect. And I always ask one more too. So my second goal is always to put you in the best light and promote you the best I can. I know you're in Ann Arbor. Can you tell people the name of your practice and how people can find you? And are you still accepting new patients? Yeah, I am. And my practitioners also. Okay. My website is the NHCAA.com. And that's for, that stands for the Nutritional Healing Center, Ann Arbor. And um, what's, what's the other part of that? So question? you're on TikTok. I don't think you're on Instagram, are you? Not really. My office is on Instagram, but I've never, ever put a lot of effort into Instagram. Okay. And then you're also on YouTube. And what's your, is it just your name on YouTube? Yeah, I just searched my name, Darren Schmidt, DC or whatever. I think that, yeah. YouTube has been um, such a great thing for my office, for the marketing, for education, but they, they've censored me a few times and I'm not a fan of YouTube and Google. I started on, on TikTok 
and it's so fun. TikTok is so much fun. It's it's the best platform without a doubt. If anybody has any negative thoughts about TikTok, it's because Mark Zuckerberg paid a PR firm to say bad things about TikTok, and he's trying to take that down. So right now, I got twenty four thousand followers on TikTok, and I'm just telling stories. And on YouTube, I have one hundred sixty three thousand followers. And in there, I get more technical. I talk about conditions and supplements and stuff like that. But TikTok is a, is a lot more fun. I think everyone's afraid of TikTok because they're afraid they steal your information. But Google already has your information. so <laughs> Right. And, and Zuckerberg has sold their information to the Chinese communists already. Yeah. So th- it's already out there. So might as well be on TikTok. Right. Yeah. Well, Dr. Darren, I cannot thank you enough for coming back on the podcast. I hope you enjoy the rest of the week and I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Fred. Thank you.